All right, welcome back. So in this video, I'm going to talk about what fintech actually is. So what I'll do is I'll define fintech and I'll describe some of the basic areas of fintech. Then I'll talk about some of the factors that are driving the growth in fintech. And then finally, you'll get my opinion on really why fintech is so important and what its likely impact will be on finance. So how should we define fintech? Well, there's many definitions out there, but the Financial Stability Board defines fintech as technology-enabled in innovation in financial services that could result in new business models, applications, processes, or products with an associated material benefit on the provision of financial services. Now, fintech is a very broad catch-all term, and it's a bit of a buzzword, kind of like Synergy was back in 2007 or maybe business analytics was in 2009. Unlike those terms, there's actually some teeth behind this term fintech. Now, fintech has been around for a long time, since people naturally want to maximize their own utility. Historical advances in finance, such as the use of seashells as money, or payment of interest, or the use of fractional banking, or the introduction of joint stock companies, can all be thought of as financial advances that were built upon new technology or ideas. Now, the pace of financial advancement has increased in recent years. Because of the development of technology in an interconnected world, more people have access to knowledge and technology that they can build upon. In fact, many analysts think of the period that we're in as the quote-unquote fourth industrial revolution. Just for context, the first three industrial revolutions were based upon steam power, electricity, and computing. This current industrial revolution that we're going through is built upon connections via the internet. Now, there are many different areas of fintech, and they're fairly self-explanatory. For example, wealth tech involves financial technology used in wealth management. This could include the rise of firms like Robinhood or Quants. It could also include robo-advising, which is defined as personal advising provided by automated systems based on a family's personal information. Robo-advisors take data that's been input into an online form and provide a basic financial plan. Next, we have RegTech, and RegTech refers to technology used to help firms meet their regulatory requirements. Most firms have regulatory requirements imposed upon them by government agencies. For example, banks have fairly high reporting requirements. There are many different firms that provide technological services to help these firms report the necessary data to regulators or manage the risk associated with their operations. InsureTech refers to technology used in the insurance industry. Tech like Progressive's Snapshot or the use of neural networks to predict losses with greater accuracy would all be considered InsureTech. Now, obviously, if you're watching this video, you've heard a lot about cryptocurrency. We often define crypto as digital assets on a blockchain secured by cryptographic technology. These assets are one of the hottest areas of finance. Their value is also hotly debated. So why are we seeing these advances? Well, first, there's undoubtedly unmet demand for financial products. Perhaps people need a specific niche financial product like reputation insurance, travel insurance, or even hair insurance. On that last one, uh, the famous footballer Troy Polamalu once insured his hair for $1 million. Now, financial inclusion is also driving fintech adoption. The unbanked of the world total about 1.7 billion adults. Groups facing segregation or genocide uh, or can also tremendously benefit from fintech. Next, in some areas, financial services come with higher costs. These high financial services costs in some countries are due to monopolies or high concentration or heavily regulated environments. Governments in some countries provide more supportive regulatory environments, and this can take the form of incentives for financial advancement or lower enforcement for firms in a regulatory sandbox. Uh, so, for example, in Arizona, there's what we call a regulatory sandbox where startup fintech firms can operate with fewer regulations. Now, the last major factor I think it's important to highlight is demographic change. Younger people are far more likely to adopt fintech products and services, so countries with younger populations frequently experience more fintech growth. We can also view the rise of fintech analytically. A 2018 paper by Bezot 
showed the relationship between total fintech credit volume per capita on y-axis here and the average unit cost of finance from 2013 to 2015 on the x-axis. As you can see, in places where average cost of finance is high, we are more likely to see a large volume of fintech credit or credit issued by fintech providers. This finding suggests that fintech credit acts as a substitute to the credit offered by traditional financial institutions like banks. Now, before I wrap up this discussion of the factors that drive fintech adoption, I think it's important to mention three other factors that could drive fintech adoption. First, we have regulatory quality, which is the ability of regulators to enforce laws and regulations. In places with poor regulatory environments, we could see more fraud or illegal behavior by financial firms. This increases the potential value of a high-quality fintech startup that provides transparency to customers. Barriers to entry are another factor that drive fintech adoption. If there are high taxes, high import costs, or export costs, uh, fintech firms that provide a way to get around these barriers could be beneficial for consumers. For example, if it costs a large amount of money to send money to a person's family overseas due to transaction costs, a fintech app or a digital currency that reduces those costs might be more likely to be adopted. And then the final factor that I think I should mention here is the rule of law. And when I say the rule of law, I mean the principle under which all persons, institutions, and entities are accountable to laws. If there's a double standard, innovative entrepreneurs could be disproportionately impacted by the law. A good example of this is Alibaba, which was prevented from undertaking its IPO in China after its CEO at the time, Jack Ma, made statements criticizing Chinese financial regulators. Fintech firms can thrive best in places with a strong rule of law that protects innovators just as much as industry incumbents. Now, fintech adoption is absolutely important. In 2018, the World Bank estimated that, as I mentioned a few seconds ago, 1.7 billion adults didn't have a bank account. This could prevent them from saving and building wealth. This 1.7 billion is disproportionately comprised of the most vulnerable people in society, including minorities and oppressed groups. For example, Groups like the Uyghurs in China or the Rohingya who fled Myanmar are often denied financial or other services. This prevents even a driven person from being able to support themselves or their families. Having access to financial services can dramatically impact the lives of these people and allow them to improve the lives of future generations of their families. Now, people in emerging markets, where poverty is often highest, face the greatest difficulty when accessing basic savings accounts. For example, only 19% of citizens in Uganda have access to a savings account, while 97% of adults have access to traditional financial services in Germany. Some countries have enthusiastically embraced fintech. For example, countries like China and Nigeria have seen the rollout of incredible technology in recent years. The use of mobile payment systems like Alipay in China is ubiquitous. In the U.S., we've seen a rapid rise in the amount of personal loans offered by fintech firms. So different technology seems to be growing at different rates in different countries. However, there is a benefit to this. Uh, as fintech firms demonstrate their value proposition in one country by competing with incumbent firms, it's more likely that new fintech startups will adopt the same techniques or technology in other countries. Now, this is especially true in countries where regulatory capture is a major concern. And regulatory capture occurs when firms influence regulatory authorities in ways that benefit the firm. For example, a 2014 paper by Maria Correa in the Journal of Accounting and Economics finds that politically connected firms are less likely to face enforcement action from the Securities and Exchange Commission. When you have regulatory capture in an industry, it makes it more difficult for new firms to outcompete incumbents. It also allows incumbents to maintain higher profit margins. Fintechs can often provide a substitute product that is cheaper for consumers uh, that, than the products being offered by the incumbent firms, thus reducing the impact of regulatory capture. So now it's time to look at the worldwide growth of fintech. Now I took this data from Statista, and it shows the total value of investments in fintech firms worldwide. You can see that investors clearly recognize the potential of fintech in recent years. 
In areas such as RegTech or InsureTech, this growth should certainly remain in the double digits for several years. We can also view we can also view the rise of fintech firms geographically. Some of the largest fintech hubs have historically been centers of traditional finance, while others have not. Places like New York, London, and Silicon Valley can be thought of as traditional financial centers. However, places like Beijing, Hangzhou, and Seattle, uh, each of which is home to at least one very large fintech firm, are not traditionally thought of as financial centers. I pulled this graphic and the last one from Digital Information World. In this graphic, we have the number of fintech startups by city. Again, you can see that New York, Singapore, London, and Silicon Valley are fintech hotspots. There are also some fintech hotspots that we might not expect, like Lagos, Nigeria, uh, and Rio de Janeiro. So what can we take away from this brief overview of fintech? Well, one of the biggest benefits of fintech firms is that they provide competition to larger established firms that might be the beneficiaries of regulatory capture. Fintechs that incorporate new technology can provide cheaper, better products or services to consumers or businesses than those offered by larger established firms. Financial firms might also find ways to provide value to individuals who have less access to traditional financial services. So let's summarize the big takeaways from this video. First, Fintech advances are uneven, but investment is growing. Uh, we'll look at this in far more detail in later videos. Uh, but second, Fintech has the most potential where market inefficiencies and unmet demand exist. And finally, we are seeing Fintech advances in every area of finance. So with that, I'm going to conclude, and I hope you enjoyed the video. Thank you.